So John chapter 19, that's where we are, beginning in verse 31. If you'd like to follow along in your Bible or on your device, John 19, 31. The topic we find there, Joseph and Nicodemus risk everything to give Jesus a hasty but kingly burial in Joseph's brand new tomb. The title of the message, Best Tomb Mates Ever. Lord, we love you and thank you for giving us uh, the, the opportunity to be here, the freedom to be here, the drive and determination to be here, the desire, Lord. Uh, every once in a while we reflect upon your uh, telling us that we are like living stones being built together, a holy habitation for you. And that means, Lord, that every time a, a group of believers get together, we're a little bit different. We're not sure what you're building us to be today, this particular group. But uh, it, it will be something that would minister to each of us and to one another and to uh, the community at large as we go from this place, Lord, having been refreshed. And so now we set our attention on your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit would teach us as you've promised he would and that we could just have ears to hear what the Spirit says to us and to the church. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. And those who agreed said, amen. amen. Not often, but more often than I would like, obviously, I've assisted law enforcement in moving a dead body. So I identify a little bit with Joseph and Nicodemus. Theirs was the privilege of moving the body of Jesus from cross to tomb and of caring for his body with spiced wrappings. They were law of Moses abiding Jews. We read in the Gospel of Mark that Joseph was a respected member of the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was a member of that Sanhedrin, the council, who openly opposed the treatment of Jesus as illegal according to the law of Moses. Their compassionate act prohibited them from celebrating the Passover. According to the law of Moses, this is from the book of Numbers, he who touches the dead body of anyone shall be unclean seven days. He shall purify himself with the water on the third day and on the seventh day, then he will be clean. But if he does not purify himself on the third day and on the seventh day, he will not be clean. This is a ceremonial cleansing. It has nothing to do with bodily cleansing. It meant that they could not partake in any rituals or rites or temple services for that period of time until they were done with these symbolic washings. And so their decision to take Jesus down from the cross and bury him uh, took them out of the Passover. The two law-abiding members of the council could not participate in the Passover. Their law-breaking colleagues were anxious to do it. But listen, we might say that they kept the very last Passover. The death of Jesus marked the last Passover. It was the culmination and the consummation of everything that it stood for. The lamb slain in Egypt the night of the first Passover, every lamb sacrificed through the centuries, every animal they were just placeholders until Jesus came. He was the Lamb of God who once for all takes away the sin of the world. The Apostle Paul tells us in the New Testament, for indeed Jesus Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. The annual Passover became the shadow. Jesus is the substance. He's the real thing, the real deal. And with him coming, there is no need for any additional Passover festival. I'll organize my comments around two points. Number one, behold your lamb. Number two, be love your lamb. Let's take a look at the lamb in verses 31 through 37. Here's a quote for you. What does God say to Christians about Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and tabernacles? The answer is simple, celebrate. I lifted that quote from a Jewish website. Christians have been gravitating to Jewish feasts in growing numbers. Uh, if you Google this or do some search for it, you'll find that the article always says, you know, we don't need to do this, but maybe we should because it's so rich in our heritage and see where we came from and all of this. And a lot of Christians go to these uh, re, uh, you know, reproductions or to the actual ones in Jewish temples, and they're so moved you know, by the liturgy and the, the seriousness and all that. Uh, and for example, it isn't unusual for churches even to sponsor Passover seders uh, and around Easter time, obviously. I say be my guest. It's entirely up to you if you want to do that kind of thing. Just remember a few things. First, when Jesus said it is finished, 
that included the Jewish ceremonial law. It included Passover and all the other feasts uh, in the sense that Jesus said it is finished. Paul said, now Jesus is our Passover and, and we don't celebrate the Passover anymore. And then secondly, the liturgy for the modern Passover Seder did not emerge until nearly 200 years after the resurrection of Jesus. It's very different from the simple observance in Exodus. Most modern day Passover Seders cannot be found anywhere in the Bible. Now, years ago, some of us attended a Seder over in Visalia at the Jewish uh, tabernacle there, or synagogue rather there, and uh, it was at a time when there was some, something was going on in the world, some big anti-Semitism worse than normal uh, was going on, and Jews' uh, synagogues and temples were being targeted, and so we went over there to show some solidarity with Jews and, and maybe preach the gospel and all, and um, you know, the meal that we had was wonderful, but it was nothing like what they described in the Bible in terms of a Seder. The, uh, go to Exodus 12 later when you have time and read what they did the night of the first Passover. As far as I know, no Passover Seder that, that's put on by churches involves taking blood and putting it on the doorposts. Uh, I'd be all for that. Were we, but, I mean, that's what they did. I mean, if, you, if you're going to do something the way they did it, then do it the way they did it, right? Does that make sense? We're going to celebrate Passover. How are you going to do it? The way they did it 200 years after Jesus with a bunch of stuff that they didn't do in the Old Testament. All right, well, that sounds great. Be careful. We do not want to draw back. Now, there's not as much danger for a Gentile as there was for a Jew in the first century, but when you read the book of Hebrews, that's what it is all about. It's about Jews because they're persecuted, drawing back into Judaism, and the writer says, no, 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 can't do that. And I'm just suggesting that it's easy for us to be drawn to ritual and tradition, especially if you came out of a uh, more of a religion of ritual and tradition. We are the church. We don't do Judaism, okay? We respect uh, the, the, uh, the Jews. We, we love them as those that need Christ. Um, but uh, don't get caught up in this festival thing. Verse 31, therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Does anybody really know what day it is? I kept asking that question as I read various commentaries on this section. Scholars sharply disagree on the chronology of events during the Passion Week. At issue is a possible conflict between John's account of the Passover meal and the account in the other three Gospels. It would seem that Matthew, Mark, and Luke record Jesus eating the Passover with his disciples before he was crucified. John says that Jesus was crucified at the very moment the Passover lambs were sacrificed in the temple. If that is true, then Jesus could not have eaten the Passover meal with his disciples because that followed the slaughtering of the lambs. My head hurt trying to figure it out. One solution, however, rises above the others. There are many possible solutions to those who think this is a contradiction. But one makes the most sense, and it's corroborated by the fact that the Dead Sea Scrolls reveal there were two separate calendars which were used in the calculation of feast days. One was Galilean, while the other was Judean. Now, first you scratch your head and said, really, Gene, two different calendars? And I say yes, because let me, let me ask you a couple of questions. If I asked you the date of Christmas, you would say December. Most of you know when Christmas is. That's good. <laughs> Many Orthodox Christians around the world say it would be January 6 or 7. What, what's that all about? Those Orthodox churches use the Julian calendar. They don't use the same calendar we use. They use a Julian calendar. And so even today, Christians can't agree on when Christmas is. When is the calendar Christmas? It's the 25th. No, it's the 7th. And so this is more common than you might think. There were then two opportunities to officially eat the Passover meal. The most important thing to keep in mind, if you want to get into this and think you can solve this, is that Jesus died at the same time the lambs are being sacrificed in the temple because that fits the symbolism that 4,000 years of history moved forward to. Now, we assume as Gentiles that the preparation day was to get ready for Passover, but it wasn't. 
Preparation day has to do with the weekly Sabbath. Every week, the hours before the Sabbath were filled with preparations for meals and various things that you couldn't do because they were work. And so this was uh, preparation day. And calling it a high day might indicate that Passover fell on a Sabbath day that year. A Passover is Nisan 14 on the Jewish calendar. It doesn't always fall on the same day of the week, just like Christmas doesn't always fall on the same day of the week, okay? And so that year it might have been on a Sabbath day. This year, uh, Christmas for us is a high Christmas. Of course, I'm making that up. There's no such thing as a high Christmas, but it sounds good. But this year, December 25th, is a Sunday. <laughs> That's a way to non-commit. It's a Sunday. So we get to celebrate together as a family. Those of us who want to and enjoy that, some of you may or may not, some will be out of town, whatever. A bunch of pastor friends I have always debate every time that Christmas is on a Sunday whether they should have a service at all. And I think, well, yeah. You know, I mean, if somebody wants to come, let them come. You know, I mean, you know, so it's like, well, our staff has to work on Christmas. Oh, no. Really? Really? And no law enforcement officer, no prison guard, no military person, nobody like that. They've ever worked on Christmas Day. They go to the general and say, hey, excuse us. We're not going to be on duty today guarding, you know, the whatever it is because it's Christmas after all. So and it drives me crazy. But anyway, this is only the sixth time in 37 years that Christmas has fallen on a Sunday. Very rare. There's a formula for it. It's uh, after this, it'll be five years from now. No, six years from now, then five years from now, then six years from that, and then 11 years after it. So it's, it's got this kind of weird calendar thing because of leap day. Uh, and, and so uh, whoever, let's go to the Julian calendar where it makes more sense. Breaking the legs with a mallet prevented the victim from being able to push himself up to catch a breath. He would thus shortly die from suffocation. Then the soldiers came, verse 32, and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Roman soldiers who carried out the sentence of crucifixion served as the on-scene coroner. They knew death. They could be trusted to know if a man was dead or mostly dead. And so they said that Jesus was dead. He was so obviously dead that they didn't break his legs, even though those were their instructions. They were instructed to, to break the legs of, of all three because they had to be taken down off the cross before the Sabbath began. And they said, hey, this guy's dead, dead, really dead. I'm, we're not breaking his legs, no need to. But verse 34, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. Executioners, excuse me, executioners didn't normally plunge a spear into the crucified. This is another inadvertent fulfillment of prophecy that's going to be quoted in verse 37. So they didn't do what they normally did, but they did what they didn't normally do. Got it? Something like that. I think you understand where I'm going with that. Uh, there are a few explanations for what exactly happened with the blood and the water. We don't really know the medical significance. You know, I love the Internet. Don't you love the Internet? It's the best and worst thing ever. Yeah. But as far as research, you can say, did blah, 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 blood and water, and you'll see that, oh, no, because, you know, from the pulpit sometimes, this is, this is what it meant, and this is the only way blood and water comes out. Uh, doctors can't agree on what's going on with the blood and water. And there are four or five different things. Uh, and so, no problem. I mean, here's what A.W. Pink says. He says, blood should flow from one now dead, that blood and water should issue together, yet separated was clearly a miracle. The water and the blood came forth to bear witness that God has given to us eternal life and that this life is in his Son. And so the point is sometimes that it happened, and it happened for a reason, uh, and we don't really need to know exactly, you know, what would happen if, if they did it again. Uh, we just need to know that his side was pierced and it wasn't something that Romans normally did, but it fulfilled scripture. And so verse 35, he who has seen this has testified and his testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. 
Now, John's talking about himself, and he could have inserted this declaration just about anywhere in his gospel. Why here? Well, I I know this might sound obvious, but it's super important that Jesus died. Going back to the Garden of Eden, God told our parents that if they disobeyed his one command, if they sinned, they would die. They sinned, bringing death upon themselves and their descendants. That's you and I. Sin demands death. God said, when you sin, you die. Paul put it this way, the wages of sin or what's due for sin is death. God promised, though, that he would come as the seed of the woman to be a substitute in paying the penalty of death. Right there in in the Garden of Eden is what they call the first gospel, the first evangelistic message, where the Lord says, you're going to die, and and all your offspring are going to die, and if nothing happens, you're going to die eternally, but something is going to happen. The seed of the woman is going to crush the devil and be the substitute for our penalty. Now, it would take some time. 4,000 years has gone by between then and the cross. In the meantime, God said he would accept animal sacrifices as temporary substitutes. And so he says, hey, I'm going to come and die in your place. I can't do it right now because it's a pretty involved plan. And you're going to see it unfold over the next 4,000 years. But it's going to happen just the way I promised it would. And we think, man, that's a long time. But Peter said in his epistle, remember, how long is a thousand years to the Lord? A day. A day is like a thousand years. Not that it's an equivalence. You know, it isn't a math thing. It's that it's a short time for God. But if you read the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, you see all the things that had to happen to bring Jesus into earth uh, through the virgin birth of Mary so that he could be the sacrifice for our sin. Seeing all men are born with a sin nature, the substitute for us must be born miraculously. The only possible resolve to that is that he be born to a virgin, be God incarnate. Being without sin, he could take our sin and give us his righteousness. And that's what being a Christian means technically. You come to the cross, you know that you're a sinner in need of salvation, and the Lord says, I died here to take your sin upon myself as your substitute And you now can have my righteousness, like a robe that you wear that identifies you as a Christian. Are you righteous? No, you won't be until you're raised from the dead or raptured and you have a perfect body. But God sees you as righteous. He declares you justified before him. He justifies sinners based on the substitution of his son. Salvation only comes through substitution. Verse 36, for these things were done that this scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And another scripture says, they shall look upon him whom they pierced. These verses are Numbers 9, 12 and Zechariah 12, 10. I like to think of John as a guy who did weekly prophecy updates in the church, right? Well, I mean, he's a big prophetic guy, right? The book of the Revelation, that would be all his doing under the inspiration of the Spirit. But he he brings up in this section about Jesus and his crucifixion, he's continually referring to uh, fulfilled prophecies and pointing out to the reader uh, these uh, fulfillments of prophecy because that is a, a powerful testimony. Even more powerful, Jesus fulfilled them while dead. He was dead when they decided to not mallet his legs. He was dead when they pierced his side. He was dead when he was buried among the wealthy in an unused tomb. I'd like to see Nostradamus try any of those. I get thoroughly annoyed by the attention so-called educational television pays to Nostradamus and his weird what they call quatrains. I'm just going to call them paragraphs because I can't stand that word. There's a, if you read any scholarly stuff, I try that sometimes, but you know, I, I can only read a short amount of it, but there's one author I read, he's a good guy, but he talks at the little sections of scripture, he calls them pericopes. Yeah, it's spelled pericope, but I think it's spelled, it's pronounced pericope. And every time I see one, I'm just like, no, I, I'm not going to say that. So this paragraph. So uh, this guy Nostradamus, In 1555, he published a work with 1,500 paragraphs. Scholars have found an amazing nine that might be considered prophetic if you look back on history kind of liberally. Like there's one that talks about Hister. You know who that is? 
Hitler. Hister, Hitler, Hitler, Hister. Did you know that Jesus fulfilled 27 messianic prophecies in one day? Or that he fulfilled 300 plus throughout his whole life? Hugh Ross writes, unique among all books ever written, the Bible accurately foretells specific events in detail years or centuries before they occur, not looking back, trying to find something that might be true, but before they occur. Approximately 2,500 prophecies appear in the pages of the Bible, 2,000 of which have already been fulfilled to the letter with no errors. The remaining 500 or so reach into the future and are unfolding as days go by. Since the probability for any one of these prophecies having been fulfilled by chance averages less than 1 in 10, figured conservatively, and since the prophecies are for the most part independent of one another, the odds for all those prophecies having been fulfilled by chance without error is less than 1 in 10 to the 2,000th power. That would be 1 with 2,000 zeros written after it, which is like saying it's not possible. Right? It's mathematically impossible. Unless you're a mathematician or an atheistic scientist who says, sure it is. Give me an infinite number of universes and anything is possible. And so that's what it comes to now. Science is now Dr. Strange. Right? It's like, I, yeah, you're right. If there was only this one universe, I'd have to say there's a creator. And I'd have to say that, you know, that prophecy proves it true. But there are infinite universes, and so I don't care what you think. I just know that I don't like to retain God in my knowledge because I'm, you know, smarter than God. And so that's really where we're at. I do find it uh, even more outrageous that so many Christians have no interest in future prophecy whatsoever. And it's just at the time so many things are being set up for the Great Tribulation. I mean, I really think that your non-believing friends, uh, you know, if they heard even a little bit of a prophecy update, they would go, really, that's what the Bible says? Because nobody's telling them anymore about prophecy, and so let's do it. A.W. Tozer writes, believing is directing the heart's attention to Jesus. It is lifting the mind to behold the Lamb of God and never ceasing that beholding for the rest of our lives. We would do well to memorize and meditate on these words by Amy Carmichael, from all that dims thy Calvary, O Lamb of God, deliver me. Now we've got some verses left, verses 38 through 42. Beloved, your Lamb. I got to thinking about the fun funeral of Queen Elizabeth II. It's the most recent state-sponsored celebration for a beloved monarch. Her body was laid in state for four days in Westminster Abbey. Initial reports say that a quarter of a million people shuffled by to pay their respects. The funeral itself was attended by about 2,000 people. Four billion people, half of the world's population, watched on television or through some other video means. Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, those of under the earth that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The attendance for the funeral of Jesus was two and they were the morticians who prepared his body. Sounds pretty bleak. But if you think about it long enough, you realize it's perfect for the life and death of the Savior. Because he said he came to die in our place, that we were enemies of his when he came, and that his own people would not recognize him. And so it actually it kind of fulfills everything that you would expect. Verse 38, after this, Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took the body of Jesus. A lot of commentary ink has been used dissing Joseph for believing secretly for fear of the Jews. A couple of things came to mind. I was privileged in the 1980s to smuggle Bibles into China. While we were there, we were able to meet with a couple, a married couple of a Christians, underground Christians. Uh, they, uh, he was a teacher at the university, and they lived on campus, and we had to sneak around at night in dark cover. It was all covert stuff, but we got to meet with them. And uh, I would never even think to criticize them for staying under the communist radar. Uh, you know, I, I didn't go in there as a brash American. Well, I did go in there as a brash American, but I didn't say, 
you guys should just, you know, get out there and tell everybody you're Christians. I mean, you just don't do it, right? I mean, so would we say, oh, well, you're in fear. You know, perfect love casts out fear or anything like that. No. I mean, that, that's perfectly understandable. The, you know, I, in talking with them, it's clear they would not deny Christ in order to save their lives, but they weren't going to go and, you know, register as Christians or anything like that. And then we also, we tend to forget that sanctification is a process. We grow in the Lord. We mature in the Lord. Joseph was growing. If you want to say that he was a secret disciple, not anymore. I mean, he, bolder than anybody that day, bolder than all the other disciples, bolder than John, bolder than Nicodemus who helped him, he came forward and he said, I, Joseph, want the body of Jesus. And I want it right now so that I can honor him in burial. There's a catchphrase that I really don't think is biblical. You've heard it. If Jesus is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Has there ever been a believer who could honestly say, Jesus is the Lord of all my life? There isn't a word or a thought that I think or say that is outside of the will of God. I am 100% committed and submitted to the Lord, and you see it in the way I live. Eh. No, that's, that's, you know, that's not possible. And so it gets into a matter of degrees. What degree Christian do I have to be? To, you know, what, what line do I have to exceed to where I can say, okay, now I'm in the Lord of all category? Because you're not. And so uh, you know, here's, what's his name? Joseph and Nicodemus too, growing in the Lord. And that's what we all do. We grow in the Lord. And so, uh, you know, J.C. Ryle says of this, let us not judge others rashly and hastily. Let's believe that a man's beginnings in religion may be small, and yet his latter end may greatly increase. Has a man real grace? Has he within him the genuine work of the Spirit? This is the grand question. And so the more I thought about it this week, the more heroic these guys became. Joseph and Nicodemus risked everything. It would be suspicious in the eyes of Rome, considering there was talk of Jesus being an insurrectionist bent on overthrowing Caesar, they'd for sure be added to the terrorist watch list. I mean, this wouldn't help them uh, with the government at all. The Jews might excommunicate them, cutting them off completely, seeing as they had decreed no one should have anything to do with Jesus, and seeing as they had put Jesus to death, and that these guys were part of the council. There's no indication that Joseph or Nicodemus had any hope that Jesus was going to rise from the dead, and so they did it because it was the right thing to do. In each of our lives, at some point or points, it probably won't be as dramatic as this, but there's, there come a time when you're going to have to put something on the line, when doing the right thing is going to cost you something, maybe something dear. Uh, and, and so... Um, you know, if people look at you as a secret believer or, you know, a fearful believer, God's working in your life. Don't worry. He'll bring you to that place where you can make the right decision and say that you love him more than anything. Nicodemus, verse 39, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Nicodemus, too, has been criticized because he first came by night to talk with Jesus. It's assumed that he came under cover of darkness for fear of the Jews. If that's true, I have no problem with that either. You can't expect Nicodemus to be a mature Christian before he was a Christian, right? He came to talk to Jesus, and Jesus said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. You're not even a Christian. You need the Holy Spirit. So why criticize him for being afraid? Of course he was afraid. But here, neither one of them is afraid anymore. They just are doing what is right. And so we need to be careful with our expectations of people. How old are they in the Lord? What's their situation? What's going on in their life? Uh, before their own Lord, they stand or fall. Let Jesus judge others in terms of their service and maturity. We don't need to. 100 pounds of myrrh and aloes, man, that was a lot of money. Uh, a lot of essential oil went into that. <laughs> but this wasn't your basic DIY Messiah funeral hack. This was extravagant. 
Believers struggle with giving, especially monetary giving. The amount you give isn't the critical issue. Giving materially to the Lord is a matter for the heart to determine and not for some percentage. Think about love at its best. Does love withhold? Is love ever stingy? Does love cut corners? The answer to that and questions like it, of course, are no. Is love sacrificial? Yes. Love is more like Mary breaking an alabaster jar of costly fragrant oil and pouring it on Jesus' feet, or Nicodemus bringing the, these uh, myrrh and aloes worth many, many dollars. When you talk to the Lord about giving, he's talking to you about loving. And the question is, was Jesus a giver? Was he generous? Of course. And so his disciples will be generous givers as well. Uh, and so just think about that. So when you're contemplating different giving, uh, contemplate the Lord's love for you. Uh, you know, the Lord says, hey, do you love me? You might be able to communicate that with a widow's might or like the rich young ruler, the Lord may require everything. And so he set the parameter. Uh, that's a pretty big line. W the smallest amount of money anybody could have and in one sense, the greatest amount of money anybody could have. Uh, and so we are all on that kind of a line trying to determine uh, what the Lord is saying to us. And so just let him speak to you and do what he wants. Um, I bring up a disclaimer because, you know, we, we almost never talk about money. Uh, we talk about it. I always say, hey, we talk about it when it's in the scripture. And it is. Um, I am so, every day I think how blessed I am that for 37 years we have never really had a financial problem here at the church. And uh, it's not due to good management. I mean, we have good management. It's not due to that. It's certainly not my doing. Nobody's blowing a horn for anybody. It's the Lord. Uh, and so if you're hearing me this morning and starting to get a sour feeling like, oh, they're going to start a project. They need money for the bathroom remodel, so they're going to put a toilet on stage and have, <laughs> have people donate into the toilet. Yeah, no. Uh, I'm just teaching, just teaching from the word, and I'm letting you know that we appreciate whether you give a mite or a million, we appreciate it. Uh, if you don't give anything, we still appreciate it. All this is between you and the Lord. And on that level, really, though, I mean, seriously, you know, you know the, the Lord says, hey, what did I give for you? Now, what are you going to give to me? And, and it's a love thing. It's a love thing. Those of you who have ever been in love uh, know what I'm talking about. Verse 40, then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. First century Hebrew culture was a rush to bury bunch. Shemuel Shafrai, professor emeritus of history of Jewish people at Hebrew University says, the traditions about the customs of Jerusalem report that one should not keep the corpse through the night, but rather bury it on the very day of their death. Leaving a corpse unburied through the night was permitted only if more time was needed for the preparation of the body. So, for example, if you were waiting for FedEx to bring your shroud from Turin, Italy, you might be able to put it off a day or two, uh, that kind of thing. But otherwise, hey, it's right now. It'd be like us having church right now and somebody opens the door and says, hey, Shemuel died. All right, yeah, I'm, on the, uh, you know, I'm on the flowers. Can you do some egg salad back there? You know, and so, I mean, you've got to get this guy buried. Now, in the place where he was crucified, verse 41, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. The Jews in the first century, Rome, practiced what is called second burial. Archaeologist Ronnie Reich says, the process of Jewish burial in second temple period took place in two stages. First, the dead person was buried on a ledge of a rock-hewn tomb. Then, after about one year, when the body had decomposed, Family members of the deceased returned to the tomb, gathered the bones, and put them into a small box of stone or wood called an ossuary. Fun day that must have been, right? <laughs> Come on, kids, I want to teach you about death. Have you made the preparations necessary for your final arrangements? Do you get guilty when you drive by Peoples or Whitehurst McNamara and they, they're like, hey, you need to make you know, your preparations today? Oh, man, is this like a Grim Reaper thing or what? And maybe some of you probably have because you're that kind of people. Some of you are like me and you just leave it to your family to burden them with it. Uh, <laughs> I'm dead, so what do I care? But Jesus, <laughs> oh man, I don't know what I'm talking about now. 
So there they laid Jesus, verse 42, because of the Jews' participation, uh, preparation day, rather, for the tomb was nearby. This funeral was on a strict schedule. Jesus dismissed his spirit at around 3 p.m. The Sabbath began at sundown, so there were only a few hours in between for these guys. They had to hustle. Now, we're not told the ages of Joseph or Nicodemus. We think of them as old, creaky men, uh, but that's a bias. They were at least 40 years old in order to serve on the council, but they could have still been in their 40s or 50s, totally physically capable of carrying this out without help. Their lives changed dramatically in just a few hours. They were bold off the charts. They cared nothing about the action of the council or the reaction of Rome. They unashamedly identified with Jesus in his death and burial. They were not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What a stunning transformation before even the Holy Spirit was totally given. But we would have to say that they were acting in the power of the Spirit in an Old Testament sense, him coming upon them for this boldness. And I mean, really, the more you think of it, this was everything. Everything they had lived for, their careers, their families, their Judaism, everything was on the line. And yet they were, they were impressed by God to do this. Are you a secret disciple? That could change in a short time. Joseph and Nicodemus are role models. They went from cowering to courageous. But what's exciting is that it's Jesus who is working in you and upon you. He that began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. Uh, It's not Jesus isn't just saying, hey, you're on your own. I want to see how bold you can be without me. No, he indwells you by the Holy Spirit. And all you need to do is believe that you can obey God. Believe that you can do it. I think the thing that hinders most Christians from being more Christ-like is that we convince ourselves the Christian life is too hard and that I don't have enough knowledge to do it. I need more knowledge. I need more seminars. I need more book reading. I need something. All the while, the Lord is saying, I live in you. You may not know hardly anything, but you know enough to obey me. I think every, I'm not against, I have to say what I'm not against because people say, oh, Pastor Gene's against all these things. But there are all kinds of seminars and and, uh, retreats and all that, right? All of them should just be about the Holy Spirit. They all ought to be about me and you believing more that the Holy Spirit empowers us and enables us to do God's will through God's word. And, And so these guys did. And they stepped up and you see the effect of it Joseph, the commentators point out that he's not mentioned very much in Scripture. He's mentioned a lot in history, in Christian history, though, isn't he? We remember him all the time as one of the great disciples, he and Nicodemus, who maybe were afraid at first, like all of us were, but who ended up uh, really kind of stealing the show when it comes to boldness.